So the clam instant pop-up that you guys know we love, we've used it every night up until this summer. And the only thing that's gone wrong with it, the nuts have come loose on some of the supporting bars, so we had to replace them. And then one night in the middle of the dark, I tripped over a rock and ran a metal marshmallow skewer through the mesh. It did rip it, but the rip has not continued. So this thing is a beast, but it does remind me that I probably should be bringing lights out with me to my campsite. And that leads me to the Lucy light, which we no longer have anymore because East ripped the handle out of the top of it so we can't hang it anymore. East. What? The BioLite base light. Love it. Especially with the lantern. Want to save some money? You can use and purchase this lantern on its own without the base light, but you'll lose the dimming feature. Both of these have been used and abused. I've maybe topped off the battery on this once. It seems to last forever. And then I'm also using the 7800 mAh capacity of this to top off my phones and drones and things like that. And I find I most often use this base light with our pop-up privacy tent. For those of you who often ask what we store in our box, I'll try to show you today some of the items. I won't show the fishing gear and things like that, but it'll give you an idea. Got another instant pop-up tent here, just like the clam tent. This thing, we've never had to wax the zippers, we haven't waterproofed it, but it really is built to last. However, this year, one of the poles has come loose. So as you can see, these poles stick in here from its bracket, and that makes this really hard to collapse. And I know many of you are going to say, Drew, that's a simple fix with Gorilla Glue. And you're right. And even though we love the instant pop-up shower tent, we're finding here in the lower 48, we don't use it as often as Alaska because here there's just so much more space when boondocking. We haven't had neighbors. And so that allows us to do open air showers, open air bathrooms. And if you haven't taken a good poop while sitting under the stars, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> so this is our current bathroom setup. It is just an aluminum foldable toilet. You know we've been using this a lot lately. I like the height of it. It may be a little high for some people. I find that it's so nice that it folds down flat because it'll fit in almost anywhere in the camper or the tow vehicle. And in terms of stability, this is the most stable toilet we found out here. Even on uneven surface, it tends to hold pretty well. I keep losing though one of these, the rubber foot, so that's a gripe about this one. Wait, what's that you said? Oh, Gorilla Glue? <laughs> of course. And beings were on the subject of toilets. This is the pot tea. I actually grabbed this because there's so many of you that keep telling me I need a lower toilet. To be ergonomically correct, my legs need to be at a certain angle. And yeah, I think that's true for most people, but I still prefer a taller toilet. That's just me, I'm designed differently maybe. But this thing has a cool backstory. So the uh, man who created this and his wife, I got to meet them, nicest people ever. I'd buy this toilet just because of how great they are. But he was a photojournalist going all over the world, chasing the story. He needed a toilet to have that comfort with him wherever he went. So this is what he came up with. This little cardboard toilet holds up to 350 pound individuals. You just fold it right up in the field, it's pretty instant. And I was a little worried about how does it, you know, how does it hold up because you're pushing in these little tabs. Well, he folded it and unfolded it 300 or more times at that Overland Expo where I met him and this thing was in good shape. So, I mean, you're gonna get 300 uses out of this at least. And then when you're done, unlike all the other cheaper gear that probably will end up in the landfill at some point, this is a much better, much less environmentally impact way of uh, disposing of this when you're done. Sometimes I feel like this uh, box is like a little clown car. So this is our inflatable kayak that we take out on quite a few mornings and evenings right before bed. And we just cannot say enough good things about this. This is the Innova inflatable kayak out of the Czech Republic. And in terms of like durability to size and weight ratio, I honestly think nothing beats this. And um, when I pull this out, it looks as good as the day I bought it. So 
So I continue to take out this manual foot pump and our hand pump from time to time. But I have a rule for myself and that is if I ever skip an activity out here because the setup or the tear down just takes too long and I either don't wanna do it because I'm lazy or it's a time issue, then it's okay for me to purchase something um, automatic for it, something electronic. I try not to have too much out here. And this was one of those. I was skipping activities with my kids, getting on the water because I didn't wanna set it up. And so this year I moved into an automatic pump and it's been a great decision. So this pump is smaller obviously than the manual ones I carry around. How I ran into this, I was watching some Bob Wells and Hobotech videos and they've really been really into the Bouge RV stuff. So the fridges and the solar panels. And I found this on that website. So this is a Bouge RV thing. I chose it because of the price. It was just cheaper than any of the two stage pumps out there. And for me, it's this LCD. Being able to put in the PSI that I want and then walk away from my kayak or paddleboard is priceless. So I can help my kids. Uh, this gets me to the water more often because I don't have to pump it myself. And it has safety features so it's not going to explode my inflatables. How long is it going to last? I have no idea. I have only tried this for a season, but I'm excited to keep trying it out and I'll let you know in the future how it holds up. So we continue to bring out the push toys and the balance bikes. In terms of balance bikes, we've tried all these off brands, but Strider is still the best. And if you have grandkids or kids, we highly suggest a bike like this. Not only is it fun for the kids out here, but it's going to give them the mechanics to be able to skip that whole training wheel stage and just get right into a bike when they're like three or four. Yeah, keep pedaling, buddy. My mom didn't do a push. She, she like... In terms of power stations, we take out two with us in the summer, but we actually own three. We still rely 100% on solar panels out here. You guys hear that? So this is the one I think people don't talk about enough. In all the reviews for solar panels, it's always about the tech specs, but it's never about the usability. Like, would these actually work when camping? So these are the newer panels, but you know, for my tests, the old technology to the new technology, I can't tell a difference in charge speed. I can't tell a difference in durability, but I can tell a difference in how they work in the field. So these panels, this one is usually almost double the price of the old school panel, but this guy, he fits everywhere. So he fits in the car, he fits under the seat, anywhere in your galley. This thing, look at the size difference. It is so big that I have trouble fitting it anywhere. And so when I'm traveling, this always becomes the priority. It has to be packed first and then everything else has to work around it where this can be an afterthought just thrown in anywhere. And so I think for less price, getting the same amount of sun, you know, there might be a marginal difference and the ability to just throw it anywhere. I think this is still the way to go for most of us. So beings I'm on a rant kick here, let's do another. A lot of teardrop companies, small camper companies, are marketing their trailers as solar ready. And I used to applaud that. I used to think that was a great thing, but you have to read the fine details. I would say the majority of them who are saying that, it's only solar ready for a ZAMP system, meaning they do not have a charge controller in the camper. They expect you to buy the ZAMP setup that has the controller in it. And there's a number of reasons why this is a bad thing to me. Number one, this thing is huge. When folded down, this is the case. It fits in. Look at the difference here. And in terms of weight, this thing is so hard to lug around because it is just overbuilt. And that giant thing only pulls in 70 watts of solar where these little guys are like 100 to 120 watts. And then look at this dinky little charge controller. Why can't one of these be installed in the small camper trailer? It's tiny. We don't need to haul around this giant panel when we could have a charge controller built in the camper and then use our own more affordable 
lighter and more powerful panels. So I just feel confused and maybe you guys can help me. Why does everybody in the overlanding industry use these Zamp solar panels? I mean, maybe it's because they have the space in the back of their truck to throw it, but they're heavy, they're hard to move around camp, they cost a lot, they weigh a lot. I just don't get it. And to me, I still would prefer a portable power station with a small portable panel. That way I can chase the sun, it fits everywhere, and it doesn't add weight to my rig. So our tables are an area I'm not satisfied. So this is the Sportineer table. This was an accidental table I picked up in that it showed up and it was so much shorter than I thought it was going to be. And that's what I love about it. This table fits all our chairs. It's at the right height where most camping tables are too tall to be used with a chair, but too short to be used standing up. But with this table, what I found is it requires a bit of weight. So if you're just putting on a drink, it might not be enough weight to get it centered. And then the other issue I found, because it likes weight, I overused it. I over trusted this table. So I was putting 40 pound water jugs on it and it worked great. But then I got overconfident and put a 40 pound jug on it on an unlevel surface and I bent the rods. Just so you guys know, I would never take all my morning dishes and hide them over there just to impress you guys. I, would never, do, I would never do that. I'm, I'm keeping this real for you. Don't, don't. As much as I love giving the Zamp a hard time, just that 70 watt panel has ran our 42 liter fridge, the fantastic fan and all these lights for over a month now. This is one of those moments, I wish those people that saw our first Ice Co video, there was a small group of naysayers in there that said, well, your test was done in Alaska. It's never gonna work in the lower 48. We've been here, like I said, for a month, and the temperatures, I believe, have never dropped below 90. And as you know, up here we've been in Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado, and there's been a ton of days over 100. And again, this is a big old 42 liter fridge running only off of a 70 watt panel. And that includes running the fan all night long. And so you know, we get offered fridges from companies all the time. And same with all our other gear. And you'll probably notice that we keep the same gear here. I'm not trying a lot of different brands. What I do is I look till I find something that works and this works. Uh, if you watch, simple RV living um, with Bob Wells. He's really pushing right now these mid-range fridges because they tend to be the best bang for your buck. So I know it's not all about gear, but sometimes there's just certain gear that makes your trip better out here. So I have a playlist of that gear. Check it out. I think it'll really help you. Otherwise, stay safe out there and we'll see you in the next episode.